of what happens uh, with the aluminium adjuvant following a vaccination and potentially where that aluminium could end up in the human body. There are no clinically approved aluminium adjuvant. So the most commonly used aluminium adjuvant is called AL hydrogel and it's something called an aluminium oxyhydroxide. The other one is called adufos. It is another form of aluminium called aluminium hydroxyphosphate. We are able to study these two adjuvants. There's another adjuvant which is essentially very similar to adufos, an aluminium hydroxyphosphate, but it has a sulfate group on it. It's called amorphous aluminium hydroxyphosphate sulfate. Look, this is Merck's proprietary adjuvant, aluminium adjuvant. And we have asked Merck over and over again just to send us some so we can look at it, work on it, characterize it, understand it. I have the letters which simply say, no thank you. In other words, they will not let us look at the aluminium adjuvant used in the Gardasil HPV vaccine. I want to show you first, the cells that we are working on are a type of monocyte, a type of cell, a little bit like a white blood cell, that would come to the injection site of a, of a vaccine. There's a sort of light orange colouring. That is the cell. Where you see the blue, this is the nucleus of those cells. These cells are very large nuclei. You'll see this more clearly in a minute. Because this is actually a transmission electron microscope image of the same cells, just again showing the large nucleus and the cytoplasm. So this is transmission electron microscopy of the same cell I showed you previously. So what happens if you expose these cells to one of the most common forms of aluminium adjuvant, AL hydrogel? So here we can see now, and it's probably as easy to look at the inserts, but this is, this is the nucleus. All of this bright orange fluorescence you see here, and even beautiful, really bright here, this is aluminium adjuvant that's been taken up inside these cells. So these cells load up with the aluminium adjuvant. They fill their cytoplasm with it. Now, actually, we shouldn't be shocked by this because this is probably, or possibly, we're not sure which of that is true, how uh, the adjuvants work in enabling and facilitating the immune response. Because the antigen, the thing you're being vaccinated against, that has to be transported to the lymph nodes of your body to initiate the, uh, uh, instigate the immune response and these are the cells that carry it and the assumption being that they carry it associated with the adjuvant. We find the adjuvant goes inside the cytoplasm of the cell. We also find that it's in vesicles inside the cells, one micron in size. So pa particle size is very important in terms of the internalization of the adjuvant. We also find at higher concentrations a lot of the adjuvant associated with the external surfaces. Here's a TEM image now of one of these cells exposed to the aluminium adjuvant. And you can see aluminium adjuvant here. And on the next image, here you see it. And here's, you can see the membrane. It's inside a vesicle. Look at this. That's one micron. One micron across. So what we're trying to work out now in research ongoing is how long do they remain viable for? So that means how much time do they have to go anywhere in the body carrying this cargo of aluminium? The HPV vaccine has the highest level of what we call adverse or serious adverse events following vaccination. The level is around 2.4, 2.5%. That's a hell of a lot of people getting ill when they receive a vaccine. 2.5% is 25,000 per million. The HPV has been given to tens of millions of individuals. So we're talking about thousands of people getting ill. Interestingly, 
In the placebo, which of course wasn't a placebo, it had the aluminium adjuvant in it, exactly the same number of people get ill. So, what is the reporting on that? Well, you take the placebo number of ev events away from the vaccine, what have you got? Perfectly safe vaccine, haven't you? Well, actually, in these sheep studies, just to cut a long story very, very short, they looked at what happens to the aluminium adjuvant in sheep given a placebo, which has an aluminium adjuvant in it, versus a vaccine. And they found something really quite interesting. First of all, they were the first people to show that the aluminium adjuvant does go to the lymph nodes, which is where, of course, we expect the antigen to go to initiate the immune response. But the adjuvant goes there too. But what they also showed was that if you use a placebo with an aluminium adjuvant, the aluminium adjuvant in the placebo, only a small fraction of it goes to the lymph node. The rest goes somewhere else. We don't know where. So you've got a situation where you've got, in a vaccine, a whole, pre whole pre vaccine preparation, the aluminium adjuvant, a lot of it goes to the lymph node. In the placebo, which includes an aluminium adjuvant, the adjuvant going elsewhere. So this has turned out to be our most controversial paper. You can probably guess why from the title. <laughs> If aluminium is involved in autism, we will find it in the brain tissue of people who've died of autism. And what this study showed was ab absolutely that, in buckets and spades worth. The huge, significant amounts of aluminium in brain tissue in five individuals who died of autism, where we were able to quantify it. And by the way, these are the only five autism brains available in the United Kingdom. We didn't only look at five, we looked at all of them. We actually had 10 brains where we could also do the microscopy because we had fixed tissue for five more. Now, it's all very one way, it's finding lots and lots of aluminium in brain tissue. I find that pretty appalling knowing what I know about aluminium as a neurotoxin. But what we found next using the microscopy, so some similar images to what I've just shown you, was for me even more shocking. And what we're seeing here, it's difficult for you to see, I'm sure, but it, this is the hippocampus of an individual who died with autism. This is an area of the hippocampus known as the meninges, which is the place where the lymphatic system and the brain come together things move from the lymphatic system into the brain and vice versa. And what we were able to see here are lymphocytes, almost identical to those that come to the injection site of a vaccine, loaded up with aluminium crossing into the brain tissue. This is a really astounding observation for us, a scary one for me personally to think that we now have a mechanism whereby significant amounts of aluminium can be transported relatively quickly, one would assume, from the body into brain tissue. At some point, those cells, as we're trying to work out today, those cells transporting the aluminium will die and they will release their cargo of aluminium into the brain tissue. Here's a beautiful one, essentially actually crossing uh, a part of the meninges involving probably a bit of a, a vessel, a blood vessel. You can see that on the next slide, again in the hippocampus. So this bright orange, if you imagine how this fluorescent dye works, the more aluminium is present, the brighter the signal. But it's a little bit like a light in a room. The fluorescence lights up the rest of the cell, so you have to sort of discriminate between the light, which is specific to the aluminium fluorescence, and the light that that fluorescence produces. But the brighter color, the more aluminium. And here we have examples again of cells moving across, this time the blood-brain barrier, the barrier between the blood and the brain. In this case, we're inside the brain tissue. It's also hippocampus, and we've got an area where we can see potentially some extracellular damage, some inflammatory response, some inflammation. And what have we got surrounding it? 
probably microglia, the brain's sort of um, the brain's uh, white blood cells, the housekeeping cells of the brain, and possibly other pro-inflammatory cells loaded up with aluminium. So we have a situation where we're getting aluminium coming into brain tissue and being found in non-neuronal cells, pro-inflammatory cells, the types of cells that are responsible for cleaning up aluminium throughout the body, including at injection sites of vaccines, which include an aluminium adjuvant. This was different in autism to everything we'd looked at previously. We've done a lot of research on Alzheimer's disease and other diseases. And in those, we do find aluminium, but we find it associated with neuropathology, with extracellular damage, with neuro neurons. In autism, it was always nearly exclusively associated with the non-neuronal cells with cells that are responsible for various functions, including functions which are directly related to autism, but also functions where they could have come from outside of the brain, go into the brain, responding to, say, an inflammatory signal to bring them in. These are cells full of aluminium. These cells will die. These cells will release a large cargo of neurotoxic aluminium where they die. Unfortunately, you know, particularly it would seem since we started to work on vaccines, the vast majority of my funding is gone. We used to be able to get government grants, charity grants, some industry grants. We can't get any of those now. The research I've shown you today, all based on philanthropy. All of it. That's the state that things have gone for me and my research group in the last five years. Actually, my money will run out in August next year. Simple as that. And actually I've been all over the world recently saying the same story to people. And I mention it here not because I want you all to put your hands in your pocket on the way out, but because if you do know someone, if you do know a philanthropist, if there is any way that, that you can think about ways of helping, thank you, I think there'll be questions at the end, but thank you very much for, for the... The reason I'm so worried now is because I've seen a mechanism Whereby, whereby aluminium in a vaccine could cause an encephalopathy in a, in a newborn child. Now I see a mechanism, and that mechanism involves aluminium adjuvants in vaccines. The, um, after it's injected into the arm, it can cause a granuloma that can last there and be an itchy, painful granuloma for up to four years, is what some of the published studies have shown. And they know that, and they've used radioisotope um, aluminum, oh, you guys call it aluminum, sorry, <laughs> aluminum, um, radioisotope, and have shown that it, within less than an hour, a large amount of that aluminum that's injected into the arm disperses into the bloodstream and starts to disperse from there. So it's really n very different from ingested versus injected type of aluminum. And <clears throat> they've shown that within less than an hour that it starts to disperse and go away because there's a certain amount of adjuvant that is not completely bound to the aluminum that's injected. So the adjuvant, so the, the bacterial cells or the viral cells stay behind, but a portion of that aluminum starts to go away and starts through this process of the monocytes and the lymphocytes that start to take it up and then deposit it in other places. So that's the, the science behind why ingest aluminum is very different than injected aluminum. I'll get it right. <laughs> I'll get the word right. <laughs> the problem is, is that we have a one-size-fits-all vaccination yeah. schedule around the world. We don't, it's the only area of medicine and healthcare that we don't take family history into consideration. If somebody's had a previous bad reaction or has had a child that's, or an adult that's had a serious reaction, we don't take family history into consideration. We don't consider that if someone's had a bad reaction the first time we should stop, unlike maybe a shot of penicillin, that if you've had a bad reaction, an anaphylaxis or some sort of a bad reaction, you might wear a medic alert bracelet the rest of your life saying no more penicillin.
but we don't do that with vaccination. We don't pre-test children to see if they do have MTHFR problems or COMPT problems or other types of norm, common, more common sort of genetic things. Up to, I think the number is like 16% of all children are born with some level of inborn error of metabolism, but because of the plasticity of the human body, the brain and the immune system, that works out and compensates for itself. But we start vaccinating at birth. You know, we start vaccinating at pre-birth now because we're vaccinating pregnant women. And we don't do any of those types of studies which would absolutely rule out a good portion of those children like the Anna Poling case that they said, yes, she has a genetic susceptibility to these things. But we don't do that. We have a one size fits all. We give them every vaccine on time, on a schedule, without, doing, without knowing what we're injecting into. So you're right. You're absolutely right about that. Can I just start?